uh, just to turn to uh, introducing our speaker today, uh, Professor uh, Tada, uh, Tadahito Tsui, I'm sorry, Mr. Tada, Tadahito Tsui, uh, studied at Kyoto University. He got his MA there in uh, 2006. And he began his career with the uh, Cultural Properties Division of the Kyoto Professional Board of Education in 2007. So after that, um, he joined the National Agency for Cultural Affairs in Tokyo in 2011. Now that agency plays a really pivotal role in um, the scholarly study of Japanese art, its dissemination um, and uh, through publications and exhibitions, as well as the preservation and management of important cultural properties. It's a really um, uh, key part of uh, the um, scholarly and cultural landscape in Japan. Um, and I, I think uh, one of the things we can consider is how it might be different from uh, similar uh, organizations and similar agencies within the United States. So Mr. Tsutsui has been supported by grants from the Metropolitan Center for Far Eastern Art Studies and the Kajima Foundation. His research centers around early ukiyo-e, or the um, uh, woodblock prints, and um, uh, especially uh, a, a painter named Iwasa Matebe, 1578 to I think 1650, I believe. Um, he's an early genre painter who combines elements of the Tosa and Kano school, and um, he's, uh, although this assertion has been challenged, he's also uh, well known as the so-called founder of ukiyo-e. Now, uh, Mr. Tsutsui has written on a wide range of topics, including portraiture and women in the Edo period. He's even published work on the 7th or 8th century Kitora tomb. Uh, this is a uh, tomb in Nara Prefecture, uh, an Asuka village that was discovered in 1983. Um, this latter work has focused on preservation of precious paintings and other objects that are inside the tomb, offering great insights into the pigments used and the restoration efforts related to that. Um, so um, today, uh, Mr. Tsutsui will discuss Japan's policy for protecting cultural properties, history, current sta uh, state, and challenges. The Japanese system of cultural preservation has been a model for um, many similar systems throughout uh, East Asia and the world, and um, it should be, this talk should be of interest to anyone considering cultural conservation, materiality, and government policies towards artistic heritage. Please uh, uh, join me in welcoming uh, Mr. Tsui. Thank you, Professor Carl. <coughs> Hello, everyone. As Professor Kyo has said, my name is Tadashito Tsutsui. I work for the Japanese government's Agency for Cultural Affairs. Thank you all for coming today, and I am honored to be invited to give a talk here. And uh, I, I would like to thank the ex-director Jonathan Zwicker for inviting me, and also thank the staff of CJS for making it possible for me to be part of your new lecture series. So today, I'd, I'd like to talk about how the Japanese government protects Japan's cultural properties. Now, most of, most of you may think that I will be telling you about the great policies Japan has regarding its cultural properties. Of course, I do hope to this, do this, but in fact, there are a lot of problems with these policies. So in fact, I will mostly be focusing on how poor our policies are. <laughs> so why I am talking about something I am not very proud of? <laughs> because I want to raise awareness of our actual situation in hopes that more and more people will join in helping us protect Japan's cultural properties. So I will cover in five topics in this talk. The first topic deals with what kinds of things qualify as cultural properties in Japan. Next, I will talk about what should be done to protect these cultural properties. Third, I will briefly review the history of Japan's policies in this field. Fourth, I will compare Japan's cultural property protection policies to those of other countries, with special attention to such policies in the United States. Finally, I will describe the challenges Japan currently faces. So what do you think of when you hear the phrase, the cultural properties of Japan? Some people might think of ukiyo-e, like this. Then others might think of Japanese swords and armor. 
some of you here today might think of this medieval Japanese narrative painting because it is the cover of the Professor Card book. <laughs> In fact, the term cultural property is ambiguous and difficult to define. It has various definitions and the definition varies by historical era, country and region. So I'd like to show what kinds of things qualify as cultural properties in Japan by looking at some specific examples. These are all kinds of cultural property in Japan. But they fall into two main categories, natural properties and cultural properties. In the natural category, roughly speaking, we found items having to do with animals, plants, geology, and minerals. Examples of animals include deer, monkeys, and dogs, Japanese dog, or a crane. Uh, this is red crane, red crowned crane, only seen in Hokkaido. Then plants. Yeah include blooming cherry trees or yakusugi, Japanese cedar, some of which are as much as 6,000 years old. Cultural properties in the category of the geology and minerals include uh, totori sand dunes or tiger rock in Nagatoro. Then, cultural heritage. <coughs> I have saved arts and crafts for us because it's my, it is my, oh sorry. The, art, uh, the arts and crafts subcategory covers six board areas. Painting, sculpture, crafts, calligraphy, archaeological materials, and historical materials. Famous artists of the ukiyo-e genre, for example, include shark or utamaro. They had a very big influence on 19th century French Impressionist painters. Other important artists include Hakuin, uh, this is Zen art of the 18th century. Or older works in this category include the mural, mural drawing and ancient tool, sometime around 700 AD. This is sculpture uh, sculptures that qualify as important cultural properties include the statue of a Senga or uh, 1001 armed Senju Kanno. This is very famous spot. If you haven't seen it yet, I want to encourage you to visit the Sanju Sangendo Temple if you go to Japan. Then a wide, wide range of crafts have been de designated as cultural properties. And souls, Japanese souls, continue to be popular with collectors even now. The next, let me talk a little bit about Japanese armor, especially helmets, because some of them have interesting and funny features. Japanese helmets developed gradually from the 6th century onward, and as time went on, they became more than just armor to protect the head. Helmets become a way of a soldier to show off their coolness and strength in battle. 
by the early 17th century, helmets of this kind had become rather excessive. This is cool and beautiful. <laughs> wow, it's very cool. These helmets seem to show strength, but it is clearly too large and un unbalanced, as it is simply not practical. practical. This is, uh, these are helmets imitating horns of water buffalo. These horns beca become bigger and bigger, <laughs> and finally, bigger. <laughs> and they love rabbit ears. <laughs> this helmet attempts to express the shape of the ear of a rabbit. But finally, there's also a represent representation of the face of the rabbit. It's very cute, <laughs> but it is hard to see how this projects the warrior's strengths. <laughs> Fish and turban shell. This is Ike. That means love on the top. It's it's like <laughs> 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 This is uh, this represents calyx of the eggplant. Uh, and wow. <laughs> This surreal helmet is no longer traditional art and perhaps should be seen as contemporary art. I think it is, this is the most strange helmet <laughs> in Japan. So, uh, this is a calligraphy and some works of calligraphy also qualify as important cultural properties. For example, this was written by a nobleman in the 12th century. The ex exquisite decoration of the paper and the graceful calligraphy are integral to each other. The archaeological materials that qualify as cultural properties include clay figures called dogu which constitute one of Japan's primitive art forms. <coughs> the historical joke materials, even those dealing with that more recent development of machinery and vehicles, such as the locomotives, or this is a globe made in 1695. These are fine arts, then next, these are buildings. This is the left is the Horiji Temple, 7th century. The most oldest wooden buildings in the world. Then the white. Is there anybody who knows this? <laughs> oh, great, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> this is Himejo Castle. Oh. And left is Niko Toshogu Shrine, 17th century. How about right one? <laughs> Is anyone who knows this? Yeah, it's a very difficult <laughs> question, I think. It's Sambutsu Temple, Nage uh, Iredo of Sambutsu Temple. It is called Throne Hall. Uh, this is famous Kinkaushi Temple.
Golden Pavilion of King Kaguchi Temple is a famous tourist destination, but it's not a cultural property because it is replica that was rebuilt in the 20th century. Okay, next. Places of scenic beauty include the Ryowanji Temple Rock Garden. Yeah, this is very famous. This is a famous Zen garden. The historic site. Historic site includes the Heijo Kyusek or this Ishibutai tomb. Both are in Nara. The next is um, intangible and folk cultural properties. Cultural properties that qualify as intangible and folk cultural properties mainly have to do with techniques and knowledge. And my agency works to protect the people and organizations that work to preserve them. This includes, for example, traditional rockerware or fine ceramic. Someone <laughs> makes rockerware cell phone. And the stage art. <coughs> Some of the actors who perform in the 400 year old traditional Kabuki theater have been designated human national treasures. What? This is Inoueryu Fe. Kyo Mai. Maybe two weeks later, you will hear about this dance in this room. Okay. Festivals are also subject to protection. This is the Gion Festival. Uh, the Gion Festival in Kyoto, for example, has been performed for 500 year years or more. By protecting these intangible cultural heritage items, we seek to preserve traditional technology and make sure it is passed on. That's an overview of the kinds of things treated as cultural properties in Japan. It may seem to cover a lot of different things, but in actual numbers, they are really very few. For example, only about 10,000 buildings are treated as cultural properties, along with about 10,000 works of art, about 2,000 archaeological sites and gardens, and about 1,000 natural monuments. They rarely aren't many at all. So next, I'm going to talk about what we need to protect cultural properties from. The enemies of cultural properties are mainly these four. Disaster, biological damage, time damage, and human damage. Disasters usually come in the form of fires and earthquakes. Japan, of course, is known for its earthquakes. This is the Kumamoto Jo Castle after the earthquake. And this is the Kichorakuji Temple after the fire. And the statue rescued from the fire. Yeah. Then biological damage takes a variety of forms. Oh, I'm sorry, before lunch. <laughs> Such as cockroaches that often eat the paper of the sliding doors found in many temples. And mold is also a problem. Since Japan has high humidity in the summertime, we often see mold developing on cultural properties. 
I myself have removed mold from Buddha statues several times. I removed this mold. Then raccoons are native. <laughs> Another more surprising cause of damage is the raccoon. Raccoons are native to North America, but not to Japan. But when they an animated raccoon character became popular in Japan. A large amount of raccoons were imported as pets. Because raccoons were found to be difficult to, to take care of, a lot of people released them into the hills and fields, and raccoons began to settle all over Japan. They began to take up residence in the attics of old wooden buildings, which were damaged by their droppings. The reason why they choose wood buildings is that they resemble the North American trees they originally lived in. Next, and time damage is deterioration due to aging. All cultural properties suffer from this problem, and it is impossible to avoid entirely. However, such deterioration can be delayed, and we can sometimes reverse the degradation using restoration techniques. Then the human damage. Because human damage is damage caused by human beings, it may be the worst of all. Most often, this is damage resulting from the negligence of persons as they handle cultural properties. This statue was stolen and discovered in another place. Uh. So how they do we go about protecting cultural properties from these threats? There are four steps we usually take. The first step is to determine which items are in need of protection. For example, every year since 1900, we have selected about eight or 10 paintings a year for preservation. And so far, about 2,000 paintings have been placed on the, the list. of the paintings that were included on this list. 90% were produced in Japan, 8% in China, 1% on the Korean Peninsula, and 0.2% in Europe and the United States. And 14% of these works are owned by national institutions. 5% by other public institutions and 56% by temples, shrines, and other religious organizations. 16% by companies or foundations and 6% are privately owned. How then do we treat the property included on this list? Our second step is to govern the handling of cultural properties by means of various regulations. And these are the list of regulations. No cultural properties on the list may be brought overseas. And it is possible to buy and sell cultural properties in Japan, but our agency must be notified beforehand. Other regulation cover changes that might be made to cultural properties. Changes in the shape or condition of an item is prohibited without our permission. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> in addition, there are regulations that limit length of exhibition, especially for artworks. Exhibition of cultural properties is limited to two times and 60 days in a given year. For this reason, the Museum of Japanese Art is not able to display certain works all the time. 
even those in its permanent collection. If you go to the Louvre Museum in Paris, you can see Mona Lisa all year round. But the ukiyo-e of Sharak or Hokusai cannot always be seen at the museum in Japan. The organic pigments used in ukiyo-e are especially vulnerable to light. And this is typical of cultural properties whose exhibition period is limited. Then the third step we take is the conservation of cultural property. This is the most important aspect of cultural heritage protection, and so our strongest efforts and most of our money are poured into conservation. Let's look at this in a little more detail. Uh, this is famous. <laughs> Maybe it's no need to explanation. Mm. Most people are not aware of conservation because conservation is the backstage work that makes it possible for the culture property to show well. And good conservation is achieved when no one can tell that, that the conservation has been done. By contrast, when conservation becomes a topic of conservation, in most cases, it means there has been some kind of failure. Recently, a religious painting in Spain became a hot topic when a certain woman tried to restore the painting. However, her efforts resulted in terrible failure and the image was badly degraded. No tourist flock to now a tourist flock to this town from all over, all over the world to see it. So from a different perspective, one might say that this restoration was a success. However, it is clear that she degraded the value of the regional cultural property. And needless to say, restoration does not have this kind of result as a goal. So next, I will talk about how the conservation of Japan's cultural properties is carried out using some examples of artworks. Let's take a look at, at a hanging scroll painting of a kind, unico, a kind unique to the Orient. This hanging scroll consists of decorative clothes and multiple sheets of paper. Okay, this is a video that illustrates its structure. Because this hanging scroll is, is made from five or six layers of paper bonded together. Restoration begins by peeling the layers apart. Needless to, needless to say, this is not easily done. The bonded paper is only one or two millimeter thick. And this very thin paper is stacked together with glue. So peeling off the layers is not an easy matter. The technique that conservators use to peel off the paper from the back is very delicate and quite astounding. When I asked the conservator about this, he said he's able to separate a single peel into seven sheets of paper. Can you believe it? Another important part of conservation work is that of filling holes. Paper in Japan was traditionally made of crushed wood, wood fiber. So a hanging scroll is a very tasty meal for insects. And worm holes are found in many works. Replacing the missing paper with paper of a similar type is an important part of illustration work. And this is a video of a conservator who was featured on the television program called The Professional that is broadcast on Japan's NHK network. We see him here just doing this fill in the blank work. It looks very easy, but we can't do that. Kay. 
But this is also not easy. There are usually many holes in one work. This is a graphic showing an original work and its missing areas. Colored area is a missing area. The conservator wants to fill in each one of these missing areas with a new piece of paper that is exactly the same shape as the hole. This is a kind of the fine work required to complete the restoration. Then we do two things to support restoration activities. We provide subsi subsidies and we provide advice about and supervision of the restoration techniques used. Sometimes we come into conflict with owners about how a restoration should be carried out. How much of a subsidy we give depends on income of the owner. We, we will provide 50% of restoration costs to owners with high incomes. For owners with less income, we can offer a subsidy of up to 85%. The total, total amount of subsidies we can give in one year, however, is limited. Finally, how are these cultural properties to be used? It is, of course, important to protect the cultural properties themselves, but it is also important to, to publish information and spread knowledge about them. There are many things what we are doing toward that end, but I will mention one thing. This shows the exhibition activities undertaken by our agency. For example, archaeology exhibitions are made possible by the collection of archaeological relics that have been unearthed around the country. Then an exhibition to introduce our collection of such objects is held every year. Overseas exhibitions to introduce Japanese art to the world are also held in one or two foreign countries every year. Two years ago, we had an exhibition that offered an overview of the Kano School of Painting at the Philadelphia Museum World. But <coughs> Unfortunately, we have not yet been able to do this kind of exhibition in Michigan, but I hope someday we can cooperate in mounting one. In addition, in recent years, interest, interest has grown not only in the cultural properties themselves, but also in the conservation of these cultural properties. Therefore, we also offer the public opportunities to see some of our restoration sites. We hope that these kinds of activities will build understanding of and cooperation with cultural property protection in the future. So far, I have discussed the policy policies that the Japanese government has pursued regarding cultural properties. Next, I will describe how this system developed and explain its historical background. The modern cultural property protection system in Japan began in the second half of the 19th century. In 1868, as a result of the change in the political system called the Meiji Restoration, Japan began to become a modern nation. This led to a variety of changes in society and culture. Some of the biggest changes occurred in the realm of religion. Before the 19th century, Shinto and Buddhism were mixed together. At that time, however, Shinto became a religion of the state, and Buddhism was excluded. As a result, a number of Buddhist temples were devastated and treasures that had been in their possession were lost. These are lost statues. A story is told of a priest in an, an, an ancient Nara temple who burned in his fireplace a wooden Buddha statue from the 8th century that had been given to his temple. 
If it had survived, it would be regarded as a masterpiece and it would be valued at no less than $10 million. Instead, it became a very fancy piece of firewood. A number of Buddhist temple architectural features and works of art were sold as well. A famous example of this is the Five Story Pagoda of Kofuji in Nara. As a representative piece of architecture of the 15th century, it was part of the world's cultural heritage. But it was seen as unnecessary and was even 25 million earthly and was sold for about $2,500 in today's dollars. If it have had survived, it couldn't be purchased today for even $25 million. Likewise, it was also at this time that a great deal of Japanese Buddhist art now in museums around the world flowed out of Japan. The new government felt this situation was a true crisis, so they issued a new law in 1871 in response. This law obliged the owners of 31 types of items, such as art and armor, to report to the government what they had. However, because this law required them to only submit the report, it had little effect in addition. <coughs> in addition, be because maintaining buildings and gardens is very expensive, and many temples remain destroyed. A system to provide money for their preservation was begun in 1880, based on the, the original decree. However, the amount of funds budgeted was insignificant, and it had little effect. Later in 1888, the non-permanent Department of National Treasure Investigation was established by the government and research was begun on Japan's artistic treasure. This research focused on Buddhist art, and in particular, that held by temples and private work collections. And an audit-like investigation was undertaken to determine the value of these works. This course audit included comments about the value of the work. If the state gave its seal of approval, it meant that the work had value. This helped to raise the awareness of people that these works sh should not be easily disposed of. This survey was carried out regularly until 1897 with the goal of cataloging about 210,000 items. Based on this study, a law was enacted the same year, governing preservation methods for all shrines and temples. This law had as its goal the protection of variable architecture treasures amongst Japan's shrines and temples, and led to the current system of granting subsidies as needed. The receipt of protected objects that was created on the basis of this law has been passed down continuously to the present. The stated purpose of this role was to protect temples and shrines that were at risk of destruction, but its goal was to protect their possession. During the Great Depression of the 1920s, Japan's elites sold many of the treasures that had been handed down to them, and a lot of valuable art again flowed out of Japan. In response, the government enacted a national treasure preservation policy in 1929 that targeted even the positions of individuals, and this law became the framework for the comprehensive cultural property protection efforts undertaken by the government thereafter. It should be noted that the law protecting ruins and gardens Historic sites, scenic spots, and natural monuments were enacted in 1919. Later than similar protections for art and craft works, the current framework for the protection of ruins and the like was established by this law. 
These laws made possible the distribution of subsidies for the restoration and maintenance of buildings and works of art. But in actuality, they were not intended to defray the costs of the crime prevention and fire protection equipment needed to protect these cultural properties. Not long after, the mural decorating the main hall of Horus Temple was destroyed by fire in 1949. This painting is believed to have been done in sometimes the late 17th century or early 8th century and has global value because it was a rare surviving example of a Buddhist mural of the kind, of the kind found in temples of this era. And such as as, uh, and as such, has no powers in other Asian countries. The fire occurred in the course of its restoration. The mural still remained, but its vivid colors were lost. Only and only glimpses of the beauty of the original line drawing survive. After this incident, it became necessary to develop a new framework for protection of cultural properties from disasters and crime. In 1950, current law for the protection of cultural properties was enacted in response. At this time, the protection of intangible cultural properties that were being rapidly lost after World War II and also natural monuments became subject to the law. This is how the current system came to be. Next, I will describe the various features of the Japanese system and compare it with that of other countries. Let me give a brief comparison of the budgets, organizations, and laws of each country to see how the policies of each country differ from the others. I recognize that direct comparisons of budget allocations between countries is difficult because each country's system is different. So I will try to make these comparisons using some standard indicators. First of all, I will compare budget allocations related to culture as a way to go the commitment of government to the support of all kinds of cultural activities. This is, on this is based on data from an invis investigations commissioned by the Ag Agency for Cultural Affairs that was carried out by the Nomura Research Institute think tank. This graph shows how much certain governments budgeted for cultural activities annually for the year 2012. When we compare the overall budgets for cultural activities as expected, you can see that France's budget is overwhelmingly generous in its support of cultural promotion activities. A main reason for this is the, that Mitchell of the Socialist Party pledged much greater support for culture when he took the oath of office of president in 1981. Since the size of the economy of each country is different, we can't go the commitment of a country to its cultural heritage if we compare only the amount of money provided for preservation activities. Let's compare the percentage of natural national budgets devoted to cultural activities in different countries. By this measure, France still has subsidies substantial budget. We have already mentioned the make sorry. <coughs> America the percentage of its budget allotted to culture activities is very low. Let's take a look at data comparing the cultural budget of federal governments with that of local governments. I'm surprised that in France, local governments also have allocated large budgets for this. We can see from this that France cherishes its cultures. 
In Japan, we receive few private donations in support of cultural activities, but unfortunately, the amount of money budgeted by the government for these activities is also small. But budgets of the USA federal government also looks very small. Unlike other countries, the United States have, has never really exercised, exercised jurisdiction over culture because of the belief that arts and culture should be supported by the private sector or at the local level. The US federal government only acts as a catalyst for cultural activities. The number listed here shows the amount of money budgeted for aid for the National Endowment for the Arts and the federally funded Smithsonian Institution. The National Endowment for the Arts, or NEA, was established in 1966 and supports cultural promotion activities on behalf of the government. And let's take a look at how its budget has fluctuated since its establishment. After generous increases in the 1970s, its budget did not increase at all. It its budget was significantly reduced during the Clinton era, but has recovered a little during the, the Obama era. The budget cuts of 1996 occurred even though Bill and Hillary Clinton both asked for expansion of the NRA budget. However, when the Republican Party scored a victory in the midterm election, the Congress passed a reduced budget for the NEA. Compared to this, the budget of the National Endowment for the Arts is in Oh, sorry. Uh, compared to this, the budget of the National Endowment for the Arts is insignificant, though subsidies by the National Endowment for the Arts do play the role of giving a stamp of approval for the investment and in the arts by public authorities. So we cannot evaluate its, impa its impact using only the simple amount of money granted. In the case of the United States, this is a budget for cultural promotion only. But there is another budget that supports cultural preservation, that of the National Park Services Service of the Department of the Interior. This agency also manages the cultural heritage of the US, and it is fair to say that this government agency deals with cultural properties. However, management by National Park Service is limited to that of buildings and historic sites, and does not include art or as an intangible heritage items. The annual budget of this department is $2.9 billion. When we include this budget, the United States is shown to be very generous in its support of its culture. It should be noted that Japan had, has a department that corresponds to the Park Service as well. It has a huge budget, but it does not deal with matters of cultural heritage. Japan is very different from the United States in this regard. So what is supported by American cultural promotion funding? That is by donations from the private sector. Donations of this kind are very generous in USA, in part because of tax incentives, tax incentives. Here we see data collected by an organization called Giving USA on private donation. Sorry, to cultural activities in the U.S. This is for arts and culture and humanities. 
This donation led not only contribution to arts and cultural activities, but also to the humanities. Nevertheless, you can see that the $130 billion donated is in fact equivalent to 10 times the, in the entire Japanese culture budget. It is truly an astounding, astounding amount and reminds us of the greatness of America. So this is what overall budgets for cultural activities look like in different countries. From this, I think to some extent, you can see the level of concern for cultural preservation at the national level in different countries. Now I want to limit my focus to cultural heritage activities only. The total budget for cultural preservation activities is large in France. But it does not make up a large percentage of the total culture budget. On this point, in South Korea, we find that the proportion of the budget dedicated to cultural properties is high by comparison. Likewise, in Japan, a relatively large portion of the budget is allotted to cultural heritage ac activities. However, because the, the overall amount allotted to culture is small, and because there are no local government contributions or private donations, Japan's budget for this is not substantial. America has a very generous budget if we include the budget of the National Park Service, as I mentioned earlier. So budget for the National Endowment for the Arts is small. Next, let's take a look at organization dedicated to the support and protection of cultures. It is difficult to clearly count the number of staff dedicated only to working with cultural assets in these agencies but this shows the total number of staff persons involved in cultural activities of all kinds. By this standard, Japan ranks near the bottom. Now let's compare the legal provisions of each country. Because legal systems are different in different countries, this comparison is also not easy done. Regulations that require the cataloging of cultural properties of interest and that mandi mandate systems for both supporting and regulating these cultural properties are common in many countries. However, the range of cultural properties of interest varies greatly from country to country, as does the treatment of intangible cultural properties. Neither the United States nor the United Kingdom have regulations that directly address the protection of intangible cultural properties. This map shows activities relating to the UNESCO Conservation Convention for the Protection of Intangible Cultural Heritage of Humanity. And you can see that the United States and the United Kingdom have no such activities. The list also shows no project in the United States and the United Kingdom. Then several provisions of laws of various countries relating to cultural protection stand out. In the case of the United States, well, where traditional immigration has been large, uh, we see a provision to protect assets of historical value to immigrant groups. In France and the United Kingdom, there are provisions to prohibit the use of metal detectors in the ex excavation of ruins. I do not exactly know the reason this has been defined explicitly in the letter of the law, but it seems there have been people who have used metal detectors to exploit archaeological sites. So let's see how many cultural properties have been the subject of protection under various regulatory systems. This table compares the number of protected cultural properties of the United Kingdom, United States, and Japan. 
you can see that the number of cultural properties designated in Japan is extremely small compared to the United States and U United Kingdom. Is this perhaps due to the large difference between the sizes of the two countries? Japan is not much larger than the United Kingdom, but the United Kingdom has designated a large number of cultural properties, and Japan's failure to designate cultural properties is easy to see. This is, of course, due to a lack of manpower and money. As we have seen above in Japan, the system to protect cultural properties lacks adequate human and financial resources. I would now like to address one issue that have arisen from this situation. The problem is the lack of human resources for the restoration of these cultural properties. As I mentioned earlier, cultural properties require maintenance and restoration. The human resources needed for this, and the human resources needed to create the tools and the materials used in restoration have declined a great deal. For example, this traditional washi Japanese paper is made in Nara. This is the only place in Japan where washi is made in this way. Production of cultural items like this specialized paper cannot continue if it is not in demand. But currently, this paper is rarely not used for purposes other than restoration, and maintaining production of it will be difficult. And because we have a limited government budget for cultural property restoration, at present, we do not expect that the cultural property restoration business will become dramatically more active. We have granted subsidies to people who engage in these kinds of restoration activities, but we are only able to distribute about $10,000 per year. This low level of funding cannot possibly offer these craftsmen the stability they need. Of course, we also cannot afford to stand still. For example, in recent years, we have began to make efforts to raise external funds. This is a 16th century Japanese folding screen. The full cost of its restoration has been financed by a $100,000 donation from Bank of America Mail Winch. In fact, this is almost the first time that the restoration of a Japanese property was made possible entirely through a private donation. Donation. Not surprisingly, this donation by Bank of America Mail Winch has been mentioned recently several times. The ex execution of this restoration should also have a strong positive impact on the people involved in it. If we can increase, increase, increase this kind of activity, we may be able to compensate a little bit for the ways in which the cultural properties protection policies of Japan are lacking. And so I am trying to gain the cooperation of many more people. I believe the story I have told today will continue to unfold. Yes, thank you. This is all. Thank you for your attention.